Hello everyone, today we talk about the coalescence of the Germanic confederacies from the 2nd to the, say, the 4th century AD. Uh, so, more early German than late Germanic history at this point. And I know that you like, for some reason, these topics more than the others. And I can tell you that, as for any other, uh, we'll never end, right? There is not a point of arrival. This thing can go on forever with a massively different uh, information brought on the table and ever more in depth. So really, I know that I will not leave enough to cover everything I want uh, were we just to remain in the Middle Ages or in other times in this case actually uh, in, in the ancient world. Uh, and as you know, it's all intertwined. Really, that's my plan for Schwerpunkt, that uh, not only people can come across my content somewhat randomly, but still having a point of reference in the playlists, in the, in the various topics of how I ordered them, but that can really connect them to one another, right? Sometimes even bridging uh, very long times and space, because I make, uh, as you know, more general and more in-depth videos, right? And to me, they actually seem all pretty much generic, uh, given what I would like to uh, to know myself and to provide you with. Uh, but I'm glad at least that this type of content is, is appreciated. So we've have, we have talked a lot, really, on Schwerpunkt about the migration era, late antiquity, um, a bit less about early Germanic history, and in fact, at some point, we will have to, to deepen that a little bit more. The point is that we don't know uh, too much that cannot be connected to these topics specifically, because we are talking essentially about prehistoric peoples that are documented by other cultures, right, that, that are also incidentally close to them, um, ethnically, even linguistically. Um, in considering the broader Indo-European cauldron that was much more diversified, much more, uh, much closer, in fact, to the to the common cauldron that than than it would grow at least in, in even in the way we and especially I would say actually because the proximity is, is dramatically close still, but people like to difference to distance, right? This is a product, unfortunately, of the of secularism modernism, the idea that we have to make rigid uh, categorization and distancing one another on the base of whatever, it's mostly ethno-nationalism, unfortunately, um, when, when not the radical rejection of, of history altogether in, in communism, that is the, the last step of satanism in, in, this, in this hierarchy. But um, the uh, the the point being, as we have seen, definitely that the coalescence of the Germanic, uh, we're not talked just by the way about the. In fact, as you see in the title, I use the term barbarian. We talk also about the Celts. Recently, we made videos about the Picts, right? Um, also, North Africa, Arabia are very interesting. Two, we've I think never even talked about them specifically. So again, that's when you you should believe me when I say that will never end. Um, but definitely what happened in Central Europe, Northern Europe, Eastern Europe had a major uh, impact eventually in, on the rest of uh, European history. And while we know a few about that, we also uh, tend to stress too much this, um, this ignorance, right, by saying, well, but after all, we cannot know. But if we look from the documented side, if we look at the Roman Empire as a whole, we will realize much better what we're talking about. Because as I stressed, um, and I think this is a, a, a relatively provocative idea that today shouldn't be really a surprise to anyone, but that I guess someone does, doesn't really want to accept in, in a broader sense, is that when we talk about the empire, we're talking about the same peoples, at the same time, right? I, I made countless vi uh, videos, especially on this aspect, right? And while we discussed the important and uh, unavoidable uh, Romano-Germanic syncrasis in later times, also medieval history and beyond, 
and this can be extended also to the Celtic, the Slavic elements, and so on, but also in different areas of the empire, right? The the Atlantic one as opposed to the Latin one, right? Um, we are talking, in fact, about a dominion that shaped and molded these people cultures in 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 what they would become. Right, and that's just an enormous topic that we could make a video on, just in from a historiographical point of view, from from a, a yeah, philosophy of history. And as you know, the migration era, <coughs> excuse me, also late antiquity, has become, um, let's say, it was at least it's it's been for decades now. We're we're seeing perhaps uh, a renewed attention today towards, in fact, the origins once again. Right, uh, late antiquity for I don't know, in the 90s, in the, but also from before, really, from the 70s even, up to the 10th of the, of the, uh, of the 2000s, has been really a dominating topic, right? An obsession, right? And there is, in fact, also a, a, a disproportionate amount of stuff written on it. I mean, if you count on how many books are constantly printed about Constantine and how many are not about great figures, even of high medieval, light medieval times, and how people are somewhat sucked into this. I don't know exactly whether because of historiographical attention, but um, there are other reasons, really. And in fact, I'm planning to make a video about how and why you like migration era so much. And, and, and this is the sad part, right? You're, you're not interested too much in high or late medieval times that, frankly, are somewhat not just dramatically and overwhelmingly better documented, but they're speaking the language of a more advanced civilization and something that, frankly, is, is more important in that overall perspective to consider in many ways. I, re I understand this is a seminal moment, right? But the migration era, this is the point, is also the product of a, of a previous background that um, is, is somewhat neglected. Uh, it's somewhat neglected, even here for other unpleasant reasons, uh, that are uh, surely also connected with historiography, because, again, the fixation for late antiquity and the projection, as it always happens historically, of certain specific ideologies and perceptions of it uh, from the current times uh, have not really rendered good service to, to history and to, to people in general, right? So that it's very easy to just repeat what others tell you, but it's much more interesting and fruitful actually to to criticize thought because, as I was saying, we know a relatively uh, relatively few about that uh, phase and what what happened, etc. There are in a sense always the same sources, and and in this perhaps this period is interesting not just because w what happened, but because of, uh, it, it's um. It's a it's a schooling ground, right? For the would be historian or the material historian, that for, for in in terms of I mean methodologically, simply as that, uh, because you can the it shows effectively how it's that altogether in absolute terms there are not a few sources, right? And they are very difficult to dominate entirely. I mean the migration era can be dominated in a in a lifetime. Speaking of sources, but in terms of interpretation, simply can't, right? There is always something more to study and learn. Um, the same thing is, is true also for the classical period, where we have even less, paradoxically. And yes, um, well, we have more, but we have also uh, less in relative terms. That is to say, the closer you arrive in time, and, and the more you see that, aside from the very historiographically, kind of officially, mediated sources, uh, we also have a sort of fog on what concretely happened. Like if you were to study classical antiquity, you read Polybius, you basically have just histories of, of pitch battles, right? And also, not just that, for that matter, sieges and so on, but um, just of certain places, and however, not really showing what we know happened in the form of much more intense warfare that is something we can document in detail 
uh, and in the real kind of systemic and regular structural way only from roughly the end of the 13th and the beginning of the 14th century right so really we, we miss a lot of all previous times and um, so the migration era very often is uh, misunderstood I would say mostly in these terms that we focus on certain specific again fixed points of reference or chosen to be allegedly so but we lack a bit the, the perspective and we lack a bit the more pragmatic kind of um, analogical mm, comparison that any evidence that in theory at least that can be uh, assumed from it uh, in many ways and in fact this is what we generally teach the migration era like right we get the impression for example of greater pressure on the frontiers in the late Roman period now this is true the problem is by which extent and to what in relative terms to before um, also to later by the way um, this pressure has traditionally been explained by supposing an increase in barbarian numbers uh, for, a, for a reason or another um, some people said just like for everything like there was a population growth right this is also again true likely at least for the my for, yeah for, for this centuries we're not even completely sure of that specifically um, but it's the indicator is as we will see today is definitely poli mostly a political one right um, the Germans had always been many right Central Europe had always been importantly populated and importantly violent in that regard because there were not really that enough resources to sustain um, uh, sometimes this this masses of people that moved right and they had been moving for a very long time in fact what what did really happen during second half of, from of the second century the the, the third the fourth um, century uh, we can't really tell like the Germans were necessarily more bellicose or um, or aggressive than than before right I mean think about the Cambric migrations and think of, of course the Romans had put them uh, uh, at bay like after Caesar you, you don't really have like the the, the limes is established fundamentally uh, the Germans don't try to anymore just like the, the Britons don't try to interfere anymore with Gaul there is um, uh, there is a, a very strong deterrent power that Rome is able to affirm on these peoples and as we countlessly repeated the Roman presence on the Rhine of the Danube really controlled peoples from both both um, sides right of of the of the riverway and the the broader power of the empire was like no right it could be difficultly challenged in the first place and it was also an opportunity as we will see because the point is exactly this that the Romans helped the Germans coalizing coalescing into something more politically compact that could be more handy in time in peaceful times and also granting them because that's also what we don't we don't see most of the time but where, where these peoples were kept at bay it's because they were also subsidized by Rome and this this is not horrors that was not just just these tribes but the the problem is that these tribes were fragmented as hell right so they had broader confederacies think about the Swabian one which is incidentally the one that crumbling apparently triggered those movements that brought to, to the Marcomannic Wars, to other Roman projects of uh, conquest of Germany that, as you know, had been uh, even accomplished right at uh, the uh, the beginning of the first century A.D. before before Tudorburg, uh, and the um, and, and so that degree of instability that we also, however, connect with different groups as we've seen just the other day. I was making a video about the Franks, the Alamanni. And the Goths and the the differences between the West Germans and also the Elb Germans by a degree and the East ones um, are are remarkable 
right? There is really a lot going on. There is a huge difference between, say, the, I don't know, the, 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 the Frankish confederacy and what that actually was at, at a political territorial level compared to the um, the Gothic kingdom in, in Crimea, right? That was really something else and that that no Germanic power had ever achieved uh, that so far. Um, and those were still areas importantly influenced, not just by, we think, the steppes, but by Rome, right? Think about the Bosphorus, uh, Cimmeris, the, uh, the not just Roman culture, also Hellenic culture. After all, the gods mostly ravaged at that point during the 3rd century, the Balkans, the uh, Asia Minor, mostly plundering the very rich Hellenic cities that were under under Rome. So there are very different spaces in Europe as well that we have come to appreciate uh, through our Migration Era playlist. Um, so sometimes we are given the impression that the Germanic barbarians were driven by a sort of primeval surge towards the Mediterranean. This is also is true, right? Uh, Piran wrote about that. Goffard, as well, discussed this imagery in some detail, right? But at the same time, the reason why these people were, again, we, we reason too much in terms out or in the empire, right? We have to reason in terms of who actually lived uh, in, in Europe, in the Mediterranean, and why these peoples were the way they were um, because they were against, against one another, right? You, we should never think the same Roman Empire as a people. There, there wasn't such such a thing, right? The, the various regions of the empire were essentially different different countries that were un, under the feudal domination of Rome, um, and that at, at the crisis of the system, also, as you know, this this intrigue that partly triggered the same displayed a great deal of autonomy, right? That there were properly different provinces with different uh, milieus, different entourage, with different uh, establishments, right? They all were represented by in, in the Roman Senate, and there was a big deal of cooperation because the entire benefit of the empire consisted exclusively in this cooperation, because otherwise it would have not existed, right? Uh, this is the, the other brutal point. So. Also, the idea of the Romans as the Nazis of the ancient world that come and, and, and dominate over peoples that are pure and free and endowed with which kind of, you know, uh, spiritual elevation as opposed to the Romans, frankly, it's, it's laughable, not just because any other people in history has spent its entire existence exclusively raping, killing, and enslaving uh, each other uh, within the same people, uh, but because what we're talking about under Rome is peoples that we're cooperating with. Because, again, if you don't have the, the, the decisive moral support of the population, which can be even owned by an elite, because the, the rest of the people is, is devoid of that for some reason, or at least agrees and cooperates more concretely, also because the coercive means of pre-industrial times were ridiculous. So you couldn't keep this thing together if people had not wanted it, right? So... Um, that's why I also uh, uh, loathe not just for 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 spiritual and political reasons this kind of either uh, far left or far right delusion that you know empires are bad, uh, especially the ones that work, not the ones that attempt and, and fail. Um, and that's that was the entire proof that those same peoples believed in at the time. But because in fact it's an anti-historical concept in the first place. Right, the say the the Celts, the Germans had their own little empires, oppressing each other and conquering, and enslaving and pillaging. But at the same time, as if if they could make this thing work, is because those w they had conquered, etc., had understood that given a certain context, it was better to cooperate uh, rather than being wholly wiped out. Uh, and in case you didn't notice, things improved. Um, and the, the broader exhaustion of the system came by a, a moral reason and problem that, um, however, didn't cancel 
in, in European history, the need of the empire and universalism and ecumenism that the same, as you know, Romano-Germanic kingdoms pursued, dramatically managed even to revive. Um, and part of the reason is because those barbarians, so-called, actually owned an imperial moral force. They, they were perfectly aware of what it meant to, have, to, to finally, you know, for example, come to settle in lands formerly inhabited by the Romans, is that part of the imperium had passed from Rome to them, and of which they were proud, uh, legitimately, because again, that was also the only rule existing at the time. And as you know, also Christianity fundamentally adopted the same imperial ideology because um, it, it was intrinsic in any universal tradition. Um, so the Germans, picking them as examples, but you say that they were uh, they weren't really the the total barbarians. We could say there were other, say, less developed peoples, of course, are around. Like if we pick, uh, you know, there is a big difference, as we were saying before, between the I don't know, northernmost Scandinavian reality and, say, the, the Gothic kingdom of of, uh, of the Black Sea. Um, the same goes, think about the Picts or, or the Giles in general. I mean, those were really primitive, but really very much. Um, the Germans, in their own kind, were still prehistoric in the technical meaning of the term, but they were also, by by an important degree, more directly exposed to... To the empire, and in ways that, that had incentivated them in co-participating, right? Because Germany posed an important political and strategic problem to Rome, right? It was never like kind of a real threat, right? Not even in the moments in which um, really a, an army, a people, can be on the move and being, you know, you know, offensive and aggressive and capable. Of of uh, of crashing armies etc like th th this was uh, a unicum or like uh, a political compaction right the, the same reason why rome had taken over these peoples by at large is that um their primitiveness had prevented them from simply coordinating for example i'm quite triggered why why, why there, there is the um, it's not uh, there are problems uh, also in how the germans are depicted sometimes or how the same romans are depicted but this idea, for example, there was a Celtic world that should have united against Rome. Well, what kind of unity was there? It didn't exist. It, it's a historical fantasy. Um, but, again, we are so obsessed by 19th century kind of view of uh, politics, maps, states, peoples, countries, etc., that it's, um, it's very difficult to even explain this without uh, massive premises, and that's why, you know, I always also hinted my pretty hefty migration era playlist at this point because and, and why it's, it's, it is important to discuss is because I presume like my audience is uh, I don't know it's pretty heterogeneous I guess but um, there are young people today that factually do not have even that kind of system of references anymore for, for us that were raised in the 90s right you know that were or already in a sense a different word from the one in the past but let's say maybe we thought that it was that lucky moment right of the let's say enough school to seriously say to to know something but at the same time being already open to the kind of more you know challenging and provoking um internet kind of culture but still m maintaining the reins of it all but there is a massive watershed say between our parents uh, and our children that I, I think it will be uh, very difficult to to gap to to bridge um, that um, and it will be a massive educational problem because literally we have not told them we're not teaching them I speak you know, even as I think that mostly uh, these people already exist, they're not a, like a, the generation of my children, they are something else, um, but something that existed all along, right? Uh, the average person has really never understood anything about these things. Uh, and believe me, it doesn't even take that much 
right? I'm not making the case that I flattered myself because I know these things or because I'm a historian, whatever. Again, a person come out of a normal high school uh, should at least have the tools to understand this concept, right? Th this is a chimera today. I would have to be brutally honest about that. And it's going to cost a freaking lot, right? You, you complain because you, you pay gas or oil more. Do, do you have the palest idea of how much you will pay? You're actually already paying because we are in this situation also because of that, because people are not uh, literally up broad enough and I'm really very concrete about this it's a serious issue but uh, the point I was making is that the the elites of, of Central Europe at this point were perfectly aware of what they could uh, get from Rome uh, positively through that same cooperation as we were saying the other day as well I mean Germanic chieftains were raised in Rome educated in Rome, they were showed what that was about, how things could be done. And of course, uh, but the Romans tell us that the stories are a bit stereotypical, but they're very funny and actually not far at all from the truth. Like these chieftains, you know, which Rome had invested so much and nurtured them. The first thing that, that occurred when they were sent back to Germany to rule as princes, they were killed uh, in a banquet, normally because of the Germanic feuds, uh, too much uh beer uh at uh, uh in the, on this occasions and people pass the swords and they they massacre each other of course this was a real problem because these these areas were were politically let's say very fluid right they were kept very you know much under control by rome that always had an eye on them but within them, right, the the struggle for power was bringing to some kind of more coalescence. Rome interfered in this, right? But we're talking about vicious things as well. I mean, the Germans were proud of showing this power to Rome. There were instances in which they they literally invited Roman officials to witness the extermination of some tribes. They were wiping out to show how, in that case, that the the slaughtering uh, tribe was was superior and powerful and great right and so showing how the imperium was displayed in that bath of blood so we're talking about again brutal realities i made several videos about the germanic comitatus and uh, never underestimate of course the fact that the germans were in the roman bodyguard in the auxiliaries in this war bands um throughout all the time, and increasingly so, especially starting from the 3rd century, made a video about the so-called Summacari that uh, exemplifies uh, the process, right? especially after the Constitution Antoniniana, when you know uh, the populations of the empire had been somewhat disarmed at that point, or had either gentrified or they had impoverished to the point uh, that uh, at least it was difficult to find records and that that's also a bit of a cliche but the point is that the records cost right especially um labor for labor i mean it, it was a problem for how the economy had developed to, to subtract resources from it in that specific moment said these these peoples out there were were cheap to hire and they were affected because they spent again their entire lives killing each other so they knew better and these weren't the only ones. Think about the Moorish cavalry or other eastern archers of various kind, horse archers and so on. We're not talking about the steppes, the Sarmatians that were as the, 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 the eastern neighbors of, of the Germans. And as we've seen with the Goths as well, they made up a great part of those same peoples there. So um, in many ways, we're still talking about people that had always been there. Right, um, the direct meeting in the form of invasion or whatever, um, we say I don't know the the Cimbri were you know it's the, the the Teutonic invasions is when the the Romans met with the Germans for the first time. Well, this is improper. We know that there was a great deal of trade between Germany and Italy, for example, in in ancient times, times way before that. Uh, still, the the the, the old Fultarch seems seemingly was influenced by the same Etruscan alphabet, we see, we saw really a lot going on. 
Think about the Amber Road crossing all kind of Central Europe from, from Italy to the Baltic. Well, we're talking about massive awareness about what the world was out there, right? You, you can't, like, albeit peoples were more um, unstable and more, and more ready to, to be on the move, uh, it, it's a bit like today. Like, you, you have peoples, yes, today they are much massively more rooted in a sedentary sense to their, to their land, even though human mobility naturally is, is still very, 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 very high. But it's not that you can't displace one people from a, like, a people lives in a country and basically does do their best there, right? Uh, hoping to, to centralize from there, to rule from there. So while it is true that, of course, for the Germanic elites it was important, and also for the Germanic people together, for these confederacies, especially, especially as they came to be formed, but very often were not even in the moment of the, of the long longer range migration, even the entirety of the people, right? Think about the Saxons, uh, think about the long range, like some chunks remain there. And this is also genetically showed. Uh, and this is uh, remarkable sometimes um, because um, you, you see that um, some stayed, some moved, right? So th these were big choices, very big choices. Of course, for them also because it was very risky to move. M most migrations actually were very gradual, right? If you follow the gods uh, the, uh, up the Vistula Valley and into the uh, the Nestor one, well, it takes centuries, right? So they were hardly uh, often like any kind of people displacement from a place to another, and and also we don't know how many were these people compared to the ones that existed still back there? Probably sometimes very much, right? Uh, as you know, in um, especially after the 406, there is this mass of barbarians that push through the Rhine, and they're, they're really, they, they enter the empire, and they're quickly on the move within it because they had to play um, fast to settle in the best places. Think about the Vandals, the rich Africa, right? Uh, after having ravaged Spain a, a little, uh, they decide to settle there and they stay there, right? But if you pick the Franks, the Alamanni, mostly they moved, they they settled, they migrated. These were peoples that had already been settled by the Romans since ever since the, the Romans had conquered Gaul. There, um, so it was normal in a way. They were just like neighbors, uh, but they 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 moved just a little bit, right? So it all depends. The war bands were dramatically mobile. That we know they could be serving from Britain to the Persian Gulf. And these people really toured the world. It was like that even before the empire. Think about all the Celts in the Carthaginian or the, the Ptolemaic armies, right? Um, th there is this kind of thing. But still the people were there, right? So in spite of this kind of need to enter the, the, the Roman lands, still, most of these peoples had thought about it, but it's not that they were just waiting for the first chance to just move in. Uh, there were other reasons that uh, had already brought them to migrate, to conquer, to, to rule on richer places. And uh, in there, there is, in fact, a big divide between the Zip and the Comitatus, right? It's, it's difficult sometimes to distinguish proper. We know even a certain de different development of peoples. We know of some, I also discussed this in the video about the, the Berserkers and the Ulfernars. Like, there were entire tribes that still considered themselves as a huge comitatus that could be mobilized and turned into kind of uh, animal warriors, uh, devotees to, to, to the deity. Others were much more kind of civilized, right? Even imitating Tacitus says, for example, the Roman uh, drills, the you know the kind of you know um, proper type of mobilization, military employment. Some were were more warlike. Uh, some were said more had greater deterrence themselves. They didn't have to use arms. It was a great, uh, just like Rome did. For them, it was a great uh, you know accomplishment to be to be so powerful so Soko used to say that they didn't have to fight anymore because they had pacified the 
the surroundings. Uh, this could come just by constant war, but you know it's um, um, the the we have we made a video also on medieval warfare and the concept of freedom. And the um, so the idea of peace in arms, right? And this was again a universal concept that the Romans also were dreadfully proud of uh, about themselves. It was the entire point of it all, right? Having a rule on everyone, so that everyone would be some kind of elevated and confer by it confirming the superiority of the ruler. And the system had been working, in fact, for a long time. And everybody would imitate that. Any client kingdom, any other people out there that you know just would do that because this is like a universal dialectic. You just you don't have to wait for for a greater power to teach you. That's what everybody does on uh, when they can, right? Just there are some that can do it better, and some that don't do worse, right? So that's also for, for those who complain about colonialism, Westerners being creepers going around the world. Well, it's just that they were better than the others and that's the reason why they they did that right in case you wonder uh and stop whining about colonialism especially now um uh, and in um in um another common explanation that we've seen many times and it, again it's true but by which degree it's not so easy to answer is the domino effect uh for which in the third quarter of the fourth century uh, people known as the Huns um, are first referred to by Roman writers and are often thought to have migrated from the Far East. Made a video about the Huns recently that doesn't really address that but poses in historical perspective what we think about political identity, which are the single most important ones. I identity is fundamentally political in any form. Um, and especially when we're talking about actual government right so um we will not digress on the hands but as you know the hands are here are, are meaningful because they are thought to have say pushed the gods in into the roman empire and to have pushed other germanic tribes when turned pushed those in front of them and so until the roman frontier was won by fleeing germanic barbarians this is also exaggerated um the, the most leftistic kind of the Isle said that these were just poor immigrants that were just leaving their lands because they were pressured by other people. Well, in, in many ways they, they were, except they were also armed. And so they were also invaders and conquerors in their own regard because they were not literally fleeing um, only, right? The, the Romans had also, as we've seen, just were usually habituated to, to deal with the habitual changes in in the barbaricum that brought to this kind of movement right um, but the hands were really something the the gothic kingdom and the black sea was destroyed like the Tervingir, what we think eventually would become the visigoths so in the westernmost branch of this essentially in Dacia because that that is it that crossed the Danube and crushed the Roman the Roman army at Adrianople uh, were surely escaping from that tide, right? And the the delineation there is pretty sharp because you see the gods uh, that remained under the Huns didn't quite reappear um, as a as as a polity uh, concretely in a territorial sense, but after the Huns had dissolved, right? After Attila had died and their descendants were actually defeated by these other peoples that somewhat had maintained their own identity, the same gods, others that had remained kind of a bit more in the outskirts, like the Gapids, some others had instead preferred to stick to the Huns, just like the Longbirds, seemingly, up to the last, right? Whereas what w we call the Visigoths, also improperly, are somewhat, yes, a, um, a consequence of this, right? They are really... Um, they were really making a choice by saying what do we want our future to be? Do we want to be essentially under this kind of new uh, 
steps overlords that do not seem particularly comforting as they they ask fundamentally for for tribute and we should be serving in a way or with the romans which is the same thing um in a way but still they are somebody that we know pretty well and that we have always been coping with um and that we know live in a much more civilized, stable, safe manner than whatever it's out here. And so in this specific critical condition, yes, we want to cross into the empire and live in there. And by the way, occupying lands, because this was known to them as soon as they crossed, that were, were not to be thought like, let's say, oh, let's take over Constantinople or let's settle in Rome. No, they, they as you know, the gods fundamentally were okay mostly fringe areas they, they were settled in the balkans as military settlers fundamentally which meant they had they also had to contribute to the roman army for whom they in fact paid a, a great a very high tribute of blood and always maintained very different uh, um, a very different attitude towards Rome and the uh, the offices that the Empire entrusted them, right? Even the sack of Rome of Alaric was just, you know, uh, a very kind thing, considering the Romans had exterminated Gothic wives and children before, and that, you know, the, the, the Goths still were very careful about the Empire, and were playing the card of saying, you know, we will not destroy, we will not kill, we'll just loot a little bit, because this is the 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 amount of money that you didn't pay to us as Roman soldiers. Um, and this is a very a very deep concept, by the way, because it opens also the idea of what kind of identity existed also in the provinces, especially in this more depopulated ones. We've seen it with Ma Maximinus tracks and Roman sources, because as we were saying before, the empire was not a unique thing. Right, the the the, the Lyricum interland, well, there's still barbarian areas. The great part of Anatolia and uh, the Anatolian interland were kind of two. Think about the Isaurians. Think about the Bagauda in the um, in the western fringe. Um, the as we were saying before, there's not just a magic Roman color element that keeps this magically together. These are different peoples, with different languages, different cultures, different, let's say, religious declensions, let's say in this way, that are essentially cooperating for the broader benefit, yes, of elites that, however, maintain also their clients in the process. And so the system works because of that. Um, free of piracy, free of brigandage, at least up to the moment in which, in fact, this, this mess started happening, and mostly because of the same Roman internal crisis, not much because of an external threat or push or whatever, right? But because the people somewhat changed um, change idea on what was best at the moment, which is not a dichotomy Rome versus or pro Rome versus Rome. It's just you know what the hell? How the hell do we manage the situation here now? Right, and the the issues were pretty serious, and were pretty serious for everyone involved, of course. This is why, instead of reflecting on some kind of, for example, the Hans are overrated. In many ways, like the Hans, as you know, in the West have become because of many different historiographical elaborations uh, from very different times, very different national backgrounds, etc. The symbol of the monsters, of the steps. I mean, even those we narrated the Hunnic identity for whichever nationalistic reason. I mean, even the Kaiser William II told his soldiers World War I that they had to behave like wild, the, the wildest hair of, of the Huns to, to be to slaughter everybody so that everybody would be terroristically uh, afraid of them. And, and you know, it didn't really work well in the end, as you probably re uh, realized. But let's say that's what they, they became, because uh, it was, in a way, um, uh, just, um, just a scapegoat. 
right, you know, th this whole mess that starts happening in the Empire, yes, it's also caused by the Huns, but this, the, the whole thing could have never been, could have never happened if, um, you know, other peoples were not involved, if, if Rome had not been uh, experiencing severe issues by a certain degree, which are also debatable. Right, before Adrianople, right, nobody really thought at the time there was much of a decline in anything, right? At least they were habituated to the changes that had occurred. And yes, the situation was kind of worse than in the previous centuries. But altogether, right, if the, say, the Huns had not m moved and had not caused, or Adrianople simply had been won by the Romans, as the odds were actually in, f in, f in favor to, and, you know, the command just screwed up, etc., we would not even things the way we do because we like to dramatize things as everything uh, whereas um, you know there were much more dramatic issues before too but si since say the Romans were able to, to dispense themselves of all of them um, were treated differently and or more epically or heroically but still you know were pretty pretty horrifyingly brutal in their own regard but the, the point being here, getting to the coalescence of the Ger Germanic Confederacy, is that the increasing pressure on the Roman frontiers is likely best explained by the political development among the same barbarians. Right? And um, unavoidably, in a directly uh, proportional uh, um, relation say with with Rome they used to say these peoples would have not even acted the way they did if Rome had not um, also displayed signs of a weakness that could be exploited right and that happens all the time we search for two mechanistic explanations why do you think for example we, we speak of a my uh, of a Viking era uh, even th that's a good question in the first place because you know if just one third of Europe essentially was affected by the Vikings, and um, but in, in general, uh, and there were other peoples who were doing exactly the same. But you know, for some reason, we we don't really care too much. Uh, we don't deem it so worth to 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 name an era after them. Uh, but the same exact thing happened at the time because during during the disgregation of the Carolingian Empire. The same thing had happened before during the disgregation of the Roman Empire with the same thing. I mean, the Viking era happened in when, I don't know, the, the Frankish pirates, the Anglo-Saxons, the, the Celtic ones, were, were using the same, I don't know, flat bottom boats to rise up rivers, to pillage, to, to loot. It, it's the same identical picture, right? In terms of, you know, of essential political military dynamics it's this it's also social ones by, by a great degree it's basically the same right and and as in viking saracen Magyar times well, most of the people who were looting were actually saying christians so this should be accounted like from a roman perspective right since we are ethno nationalistically fixated we need to think that this was kind of a liberation from rome or our kind of bullshit like that was just people who had the opportunity of making a mess and they did it as it normally happens right and uh, they were not even tremendously successful because if you just make a mess you know it means that your 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 capacities are pretty limited uh, as we've seen just yeah uh, we have been talking about the pics recently it's, yes they could loot britain etc whatever but then what did they actually accomplish Right, they surely their elites maybe benefited from that temporarily, but something they took over Britain over the the migration of important Central European population, uh, so just demographically for the times being carried out a, a greater uh, enterprise that. Um, was also, yes, more contingental than it seems, but that also reflects definitely that opportunity seizing capacity of, say, settling as a the, the next establishment in, in a land whose establishment is fundamentally evaporating and or 
uh, incapable of stemming you and therefore obliged to, to integrate you in a way or another. Think about Anglo-Saxon England during the Viking era, the Danelo. Uh, at the end of the day, they became one thing, one people, right? And uh, this happens often because, again, war hybridizes a lot, right, if it doesn't destroy. Um, but also if kind of that of offensive is... is succeeds because otherwise there is the other way around right it's that it's that defense and also that l likely later expansion uh, speaks of a moral superiority of those who have resisted successfully and are capable of proving they were the superior civilization in many ways um, I repeated this countless times but this pertains mostly to the late Germanic side of the story of course uh, Again, uh, the these uh, peoples came to rule, sharing essentially power with local rulers, which they became one, because they married into one another in the first place as elite, and mostly in, in the Roman lands, right, of, of the empire, the most advanced list. We're talking about places like Gaul, Italy, Spain, right? Central Europe didn't really ch say it, it did change, but it didn't really kind of was the next empire kind of lording over uh, the, the other way around as the Romans had been doing. Uh, so in many ways, there is a massive Roman continuity and that's what, for which we talk about Romano-Germanic kingdoms, not by chance, right? So um, this is very relevant. Right, the Roman Empire was one. Doesn't matter how different the elites were, there was a, a, a unique empire, which was a big deal. Right, you don't have anything like that until the eighth, the, the ninth century, factually, in the West, and then it disaggregates again. And fundamentally, it, it was not as large as the Roman one, but nobody later would achieve the same thing in, in scale by by comparison of the times. These uh, ecumenic achievements have to be understood, as I often explain, in, in the light of the religious military creed of the time, which, um, uh, let's say, made people much more aware of the uh, of the political, of much more politically literate in the first place, much more aware of uh, how important cooperation really was. Uh, as much as resistance really was when it was possible to, to maintain what, what you really had. So in this sense, we have to appreciate the fact that uh, populations like, like, like the Germans had managed to, to remain uh, r more distant from Roman domination than other, than other peoples, right? Albeit still being still fr framed within their uh, the, the empire con conceptually and as we've seen also with an important degree of benefit um, in the third century as the Roman Empire was undergoing its so-called crisis that at that point could have literally wiped it out changes were underway in the barbaricum as well right it's not a coincidence uh, these are happening also largely in, in function one of the other. In place of, or more probably on top of, the myriad local tribes listed in Tacitus' works, there appeared a series of larger confederacies that just the aforementioned Suebi at, at a point had maintained, still again with, with different degree of control in the various tribes, which all have some kind of um, generic name, if you want, that are international shout-outs. The Alamanni, that is all the men uh, in the southwest of Germany. The Franks, likely the fierce people of some sort, eh, but the etymology is disputed um, along the middle and lower Rhine. These are by the way, the same peoples that, say, the Alamanni were in great part um, Alp Germans that were part of the Suebic, uh, those tribes were known before, and we will talk more about this specifically. 
uh, of the Swabic Confederacy. The Franks were largely descending from the same tribes that had been protagonists at the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, right? Um, we have the Saxons in the north of Germany, the Picts, the painted men, uh, seemingly at least, you know, the, the, the etymology is disputed, as you know, it could have meant really something else, uh, in the north of Britain, the, uh, the Goths, the Goths, the, the men, in and around the eastern Carpathians and the lower Danube, especially the latter being quite extended in ways that were containing actually different confederacies on the road and covering very different diverse territories. We're talking mainly about today's Poland, Romania, Ukraine, right? So uh, also very different territories geographically separated by mountains, chains, water, different uh, watersheds, etc. Um, different from the West Germans. That especially the Franks, the Alemanni. Again, I made a video just the other day talks about this. They were also the closest ones to Rome. A bit the one more, not necessarily more Romanized in the in the sense we intend. Many people believe that, uh, you know, uh, the Franks and the Alemanni were so Romanized because they, the, the, the even the most Romanized because they had always been close to to Rome. Instead, the gods no because they had been kind of in, in the steppe and or uh, more distant. Clo geographical closeness has an importance at large, but in, in political terms, it doesn't really mean much, right? Not even in strictly social terms. Um, the Franks, the Alemanni, the moment which they settled in occupied parts of the empire, they weren't really... Like, they had just come out of the forest in many ways. The, the Goths had, um, he said, a much longer history of relations with Rome, because they, ha they had been more powerful, they were more hierarchically uh, s um, stratified, they, they had, they, they lorded over more people, by the way, so they were obviously more important, uh, for not talking about the, the northern Germans, peoples like the Saxons, so those were more fragmented as well, we talk about coalitions, but they were very loose, right, the Franks and the Alemanni are more compact, that is true, and, and that, and the reason being also, of course, that they had to cope with the Gallo-Romans, right, and Roman Gaul had a hell of a military in which the this, this same Germanic peoples participated very effectively, I mean, the Auxilia Palatina of, of Julianus at, uh, at Strasbourg were Celto-Germanic mm, soldiers, essentially, those really held the line of, 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 of the Roman army against the Alemanni in an in a extraordinary way. Um, so, these things do matter. They do matter a lot, right? We could even compare these peoples with the Proto-Slavs or other populations, the Finns, uh, etc. But we will not, at least today. Um, the concept I wanted to may to point out mainly is that while we start talking, in fact, about the Alamanni, the Franks, etc., uh, we uh, shouldn't forget again that these confederacies were such and they had this kind of standard names because most of these peoples retained uh, I mean the tribes that made them up retained the actual control we'll see it better now like by whom were these confederacies actually ruled right and in many ways for the average Germanic warrior that participated to the raids in in the Roman frontier and so on, the the main identity was his clan, uh, then his tribe, and only then he know he knew that his leaders, his his lords, etc., because th that elite was really rising, right? And also, again, in political social sense, as we'll see, were just connected with other tribes that they kind of knew because they were neighboring tribes, um, and. But they, they weren't so attached to to the name. I mean, Alamanni literally stresses this. It, it means all the men. What is more generic than that? There is there's no history. There's no difference. There is there is nothing. It really just means that there were all those specific tribes that they knew better who they were that were 
together in that sense. So and they had they, they didn't have to overstep each other. Same goes for the Franks. That up to the Merovingians are essentially just or a series of petty kingdoms of various chieftains that had essentially a settle in various Roman uh, cities uh, along the the Belgian frontier, the the, the Germanic frontier, and um, and were pretty distrustful of one another. I mean, just occasionally they would coalize uh, to to the contingent for the contingental benefit that this could provide them with. Right? Again, a specific moment of Roman weakness. Say there is there is a civil war going on. Uh, dynastic crisis the, the Roman army is is fighting uh, elsewhere so at that point you exploit that local temporary weakness because by the way nobody really knew how things would have ended right um, and we are not very in very different in a very different situation right now right you you can't really know where the world is gonna be four months from now nobody can right the market entirely works on this and that is this kind of um, you know obvious re realization to anybody who has a degree of just a normal political uh, social military complexity that um, it's useless to invest on too much of a long time in in this broader system that, that the larger it is the more complex and so unpredictable it is because again you you cannot know what will happen so the same, for example, barbarian instability was connected with this because these peoples also were pretty fatalistic regarding what could happen to them in the end, whether they would have been killed by the Romans, talking about chieftains, right, or by other chieftains, uh, by internal plots. They were doing this all the time. So let's say you could save your own tribe if you killed the guy who had led the same tribe against Rome, not always, because the Romans sometimes were, I mean, the Alamanni once called them for help to put peace internally, and the Romans took the chance to, to make a massacre of everyone, so that that's the kind of unpredictability we're talking about, um, and just for saying that nobody really gave a damn about human life in any traceable form uh, at that point, um, and the, um, they, they could, however, say, well, okay, I, I, I overthrew the leader who invaded you, and, you know, through your your intelligence and whatever that that I wasn't the guy who was pushing for that expedition against you before so you know let's make a deal and Rome rather than keeping to fight against these peoples that also again were were not that mm, at a point would become threatening right even for single provinces but at large especially where the work coalescing in fact were not much of an individual threat the problem is that made there were many, and they made the entire regions unstable. They would say, okay, let's do this. I will also pay you a little bit, so you will probably increase your power within, and so temporarily I will keep you under under check. This is what was normally done. I mean, tributes are the the most common form of political international relations, say, uh, in practical, concrete terms, right? Um, this is not true just for Central, Northern, and Eastern Europe. If you look at North Africa and Arabia, that were frontiers, right? Because at a, a certain point there is the desert, and the Romans here had just controlled basically the coastlines or the few, uh, let's say, fertile interlands, like, say, I don't know, Roman Africa, so today's Tunisia, and other parts that had entered, well, with the exception of Egypt, of course, because of the Nile, that there was one of the most radically important provinces in the entire empire that had a, a very specific direct control, a very direct line with, with, with Rome, with the local officers were trustees, etc., because Egypt was out because of grain, right, because of the, because of feeding the Roman mob. Um, but let's say places like New Media, like uh, th I mean, they were not even, you know, necessarily particularly. Uh, they were not deserts, right? Okay, because otherwise the Romans would have not been there. 
but the interland was populated by, in fact, tribes that you couldn't even really go there and kind of tame. At that point, the Romans had, I don't know, destroyed uh, the Garamantian capital uh, in the in the fifth sun. But then, like, it's not that you can occupy those places. They, they're worthless. There is nothing. It's just they're, it's, they're populated by savages that are continuously harassing your your frontier um, lines, your, especially the... Uh, the, the, sl the 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 trade routes with with Black Africa, slaves, ivory, gold, right? Those are very important stuff, and um, equally other other areas. I mean, the same Central Europe posed, in a sense, this problem. Uh, apparently, the Romans were quite concerned of the disgregation of the Swabian uh, Confederacy because uh, there was a, a, a flourishing yogurt export from Germany that hell I dislike yogurt but um, I <laughs> you know I, I can't think how that is a reason to 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 start you know an invasion of Germany but still it was that important forget about the aforementioned amber road which sounds more more reasonable uh, <laughs> as a casus belli uh, but um, uh, again it those same populations, as we will see, had been thriving because of those those trades that had established trading posts, etc. So you understand that, of course, within them, the, the, there were things, pretty serious things happening that could, were relatively unpredictable and out of control, really. Um, other reasons were sometimes more strictly strategical. For example, the Romans thought at a point to, to conquer Ireland, which they counted to do with a very modest force, because they wanted to indirectly isolate completely the Caledonians. That were, as you know, the, the Romans had to build two walls to keep them at bay, to force them into buying Roman products. Um, the same goes for pretty much in most of the Rhine and Danube frontiers because they weren't really very developed places in the, uh, with the exception of, of the lower Dan some areas of the lower Danube. Uh, but they were very important for controlling the whole thing. The same places, for example, where the uh, Alamanni settled eventually was the, the Agri de Cumatas and it was a very delicate salient there um, from the internal side because you know, you have the, the two, the Rhine and the, and the Danube Valley starting from there, and you have to, to control this, this corner. Um, in other concerns, but again, the, the Moors, as we were saying before, those were always a bit of a problem, talking about today's Morocco, more or less those areas. In Arabia, think about the Lachmans that form as this broader confederacy. Arabia was very florid especially in the southwest that was the most advanced uh, area in, in this um roman like in, in, in we're talking about petraia arabia and uh, places like in fact petra palmyra bosra etc well those were important current uh trade posts most some some were very advanced in fact were real cities and very also powerful ones from political means, we about Palmyra especially, that at a point threatens also the, the Near East entirely with um, Persian backing against Rome. Um, but um, you realize that these peoples begin to sense that there is something wrong, that Rome is destabilizing, that there is actually there is nothing to kid about it because uh, while new opportunities rise there are also more risks involved um, the mm, but exactly for this you had to become more powerful if you wanted to come to compete in this system because if you didn't if you don't arm yourself you don't start expanding in some areas controlling others you can't really hope not to be the next uh, target of some, you know, of some neighbor's expansionistic aims. So everybody was kind of obliged, again, in the, in the normally unstable pre-industrial world and also 
well, it's not that the post industrial one is very stable, but still, you know, in those times that are surely very different, uh, you know, power is much more labile, let's say. Um, the broader instability forces these people to become more powerful, and who becomes more powerful uses his power. There's nothing to do about that. There are ways and ways to use it, but most of the times it's just a gamble. So even in there, you can't you can hardly know how things will end. Um, so, speaking of the origins of this confederacy, um, like how had they formed, right? By whom were they ruled? As we were saying before, the Romans had much to do with with the whole thing. Um, th there, are, there are extreme takes, um, but they're not probably very far from 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 the truth. For example, the Alamanni, also considering their position, the fact that they were somewhat newcomers in the area, they also took over tribes that existed before. Right? It was not a there. Not a, an easy thing. Nor they were doing actually a favor to most people who inhabited the surrounding areas, but they those had already been declining. And that's why they could move in by a certain degree. Well some say that they were an actual Roman creation, set up to occupy the area between Upper Rhine and Upper Danube, right, that had been abandoned, in fact during the later third century civil wars. Um, it's possible, like, it, and it, it's not an option, you see, because somebody would have occupied them anyway, so it would have been better for Rome to catalyze this process, to control it, to appoint specific um, leaders, allowing them to settle there as opposed to others because if others had done it they could have become too powerful etc so even though this was just really happening by itself because people moved in right we're talking about who had to rule because individual people would just settle there as farmers as soldiers and even there the relations with the empire were very complex uh, if you moved in after the civil war you would n not know what Rome was up to next you could become the next subject in the area so it was really relevant it was also about the output the, again the stabilization of, of that sector that could bring to just greater stability in the region <laughs> and uh, there is also another point which is more s strictly historiographical regarding the actual identity of this confederacy that is to say we have just the Romans talking about them like what what were these people as we were saying before you know who would own among them this kind of say I'm an Alamannus an Alaman uh, well it's not easy to answer this either right some even go as far as saying that the Roman scholars wanted to invent some sort of barbarian threat in order to justify uh, the, you know, the, the shortcomings. And right? saying, you know, these areas when abandoned, who did occupy them? Who did, did take them over? Well, this people, we call them like this. Uh, even if there was a connection with a, some kind of political identity, um, uh, and uh, let's say saying it's them right there may be something in this because the, the, barbar the barbarians even the confederacies could hardly pose a serious military threat to the existence of the whole empire like the Roman army has been estimated are very you know violent debates about this but let's say talking about some hundreds of thousand men right so again it was a, a massive bulwark and things came to end not because these forces were ever kind of annihilated in a single battle 
Adrianople, people say, oh, the decline of the Roman army. The generation after, a larger army than Adrianople was fighting against the greatest threat that a Roman army could meet. Another Roman army, right? So <laughs> you have even a double uh, available there. Of course, this costed. So the people who had to work for this, not just much of the manpower, of course, because thousands of people died in such battles, right? So uh, consider even it f from a, one of those confederacies' perspectives, they, they had it at most like, I don't know, 30,000 men, which are effectively the, the entire, uh, like if you can mobilize them fully, which is an entire male uh, able-bodied popula po population to, 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 to bear arms. So if, say, they're crushed in battle and 10,000 die, well, you have basically taken out one-third of your international power, your contingently forced to uh, to subjection Th this happened to to many of these peoples I mean the the Burgundians experienced it at the hands of other Germans then at the hands of the Romans plus the Huns and the Romans deport them the Visigoths also play an atrocious amount of, 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 of blood for the Romans that crushed them several times think about um, Stilico and then even Majorianus in the 6th and the 5th century still makes them surrender. So, again, where's the actual threat, right? Altogether, again, yes, they were a, a big burden, but what happens, again, is that the empire, rather, uh, that that is a fragile thing, as we were saying before, as all these ancient systems, after all, on the long run, doesn't stand the, the attrition and the local people decide that they're better on their own, even with these other invaders, but still essentially cooperating with them rather than with the world system that is being falling apart, and relatively so, because essentially the core land of the empire, the rich, the developed, the urbanized, the populated ones, remain units of some sort. Right? At some point they are taken over by the, by the Federati, uh, but we're talking mostly about the 5th, 6th century, right, um, and only in the West, uh, and with a massive continuity of anything Roman there that we have documented, like the some, of the, the, some of these areas don't even go really destroyed, we're, we're talking about the, the previous reality living on, right, and still being, by the way, overwhelmingly populated compared, say, to the to the areas where most Germans really settled. And even in fact, in, in their case, being diluted in a prevalently Romance populace or, you know, um, in the East still absorbed in, in a much more complex ethnic reality. So, altogether, we're still seeing from both sides very difficult situations that rather at than, than showing like a an accomplishment it's just a, a, co a collective exhaustion right what you see in the sixth the end of the sixth seventh century also with, uh, with with plague with broader demographic economical contraction is an exhausted system you can go as far as saying that this happened because kind of overspent right and uh, as you know, world history changes dramatically in those in those centuries as well. So that we talk about the Middle Ages for some reason. The Middle Ages never existed, but still there are ups and downs of civilization and the migration era had been a, a moment of great crisis and distress and bloodshed and and destruction. Uh, quite quite frankly. Not in the usual sense that we intend. The barbarians, uh, especially the Germans, were not great destroyers, right? They they would destroy just areas that they were not um, expecting to settle in. But when they settled, who was so dumb to destroy anything? In fact, there is no evidence at all of any of this. Uh, the, the Vandals didn't destroy Africa. The, the Franks didn't destroy Gaul. 
the the Ostrogoths didn't destroy Italy. If anything, they, they were wars against each other, the Romans, etc., that, that created the greatest problems. Uh, the Gothic Wars, for example, uh, in, uh, in the 6th century, and also some clashes between different eras. I mean, Spain really suffered a lot, right, in the clashes, namely against, between Arians and Catholics, but also there because the land was much more composite th than it seemed. And, uh, I don't know, the Franks crashed the, the Alamanni, they crashed the the Burgundians. They they crashed the Visigoths in in Aquitaine at least. So it's it, it's a big deal. I mean, Roman Britain too was a fairly unitary system that collapsed after the Romans left. So that when the Anglo Saxons arrived, there wasn't even too much to centralize from, and that's the reason why they they don't really create a kingdom, but many different lordships. A bit as they were a bit weighted in. In, uh, uh, I mean, on the continent, which is an interesting perspective. I mean, if you were really want to see how it could be even like a time machine, if you look at the Anglo-Saxons in Britain, well, you can see, of course, in a very different, very changed way, but still how that um, intertwinement of different uh, petty kingdoms really could, could interact with, with each other and could, how they could form, even on the long run, some broader identity naturally in a also in a quite different land that allowed for on the longer run but for, for centralization greater centralization a fully centralized reality um, also however continuously had a, a deep contact commercially with with uh, more advanced more compact at least realities so Um, the um, the increased pressure on in the frontiers contributed to a balance shift that, however, was 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 settled was sedimented by by other events, mostly same wars between the Romans themselves, civil wars. Um, and some say, well, but we can't really tell because, you know, maybe the, the Germans pressured the Roman frontiers in Tacitus' times as, as much as in late, uh, later ones. Not really. One can't make that point because it's too structuralistic. Again, I if in the late empire they could do it successfully, it's because the, uh, say, the same reason why they would do it is is the reason why they wouldn't do it before. <laughs> right? So... Pressure is not just random. It's not that the Germans just, you know, press because they they want to. They the international awareness at the time was really big. And this is what we tend to overlook. And since we don't we don't have much of the barbarian perspective, we tend to assume that uh, maybe they were just focused on their horizons to conquer new land. Yes, they were, but they were aware w whose land was that and what to do about it. And, you know, for centuries they didn't do anything about the Roman one. So, um, as we were saying before, this awareness is what also derived from the same Roman political work beyond the frontier w with them. Um, it's also no surprise then that, for example, the Franks and the Alamanni attack the Roman, Roman goal while the Romans were distracted usually by civil war, right? Um, it, it, it's, it's at that moment that they coalized. This was normal for the Germans. This is described also by Tactus. They, they elected a leader in time of war. In theory, this had to return power at the end of hostilities. Think about Arminius that doesn't do this and effectively is taken out by the same Germans uh, and uh, so there had always been an, an internal tension of course within the same the same Germanic world in this case regarding what to do but also a lot of awareness on what were the, the triggers of such action 
So the Romans from their side had to ensure themselves that this 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 mess wouldn't happen. Uh, by balancing that aforementioned compaction but also division when this was needed. And it was relatively easy to do again because the more fragmented areas are also the ones that pose less of a political strategic threat. Because they have less power. Right? So the tide turns exactly when these peoples are unmanageable at a local level because they they have the upper hand and so they will use that power to expand uncontrolled except this con it, there's never like a lack of control because they can't expand further and so they will expand further into roman land and at a point they will come closer to further roman power that will be less compromising so it's always an a very long lasting negotiation political military dialectics alliance as well think how important it was i don't know the hannic invasion for i don't know the visigoths the franks the romans to cooperate against other against the huns but also in that sense against i don't know the the ostrogoths or the 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 the, the Gapids or other other groups that we we don't even know historically that's yet another thing like of course we it, it you know it's likely we missed even some of the, of the big players at a point because surely there were some confederacy or whatever that we have misnamed or misconceived etc in central eastern europe they were that eventually didn't come to affect the roman world too much so we, we don't know about it but they existed um so how did the barbarians rule such polities in the first place um consider the roman empire was having issues maintaining um, hundreds of thousands of soldiers they needed literally another army of some tens of thousands of clerks to make the thing run and it costed a lot by the way like the states at the time were not like today's they 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 were run much more freely taxation was ridiculously low comparing to our, to our own it was a very few few points percentage obviously also because their surplus was ridiculously low so actually this taxation was very high also in relative terms for them but it could be extended on such, you know, only on such enormous dominions like like the transcontinental ones, Rome, uh, and so leveraging this kind of surplus, they could invest here and there, but trying to, you know, stem the various pushes from the outside in this in this sense. What about, say, a Germanic shift? And how did they work? Well. Um, this guy was normally a war leader um, of some sort and there was the the term kunitz the, which is the one of king right and uh, that the the romans were translating in rex right that had a, a specifically sacred meaning sacred role right and these peoples were not a great fans of such figures because the the king was normally the product of some sort of um clanic of single of a single clan over expansion and control over lots of people that had previously been habituated to be much more autonomous of course this was just like the mob right every clan shouted its own liberty just because they wanted to keep doing whatever the hell they wanted without being controlled by anyone and in the process in fact not accomplishing a great much because what these clans really did was constantly again raiding uh, pillaging plundering uh, yet somebody worked in theory three men wouldn't have to work but they actually did they were slaves but um, everybody was a bit habituated to war right uh, it by these centuries we can already see 
a slight gentrification of these people. They're not changed dramatically from, let's say, Augustus times. In Augustus times, there were literally primitives with clubs, uh, not in the, you know, Neanderthalian sense, but still, again, they were extremely primitive, but brutally primitive, savagely primitive, and extremely violent. Um, they really brought destruction wherever they went, like, pick some Celtic areas they took over, they disrupted the, the local opida, the trade work, the, the international connections, minting, the, the, everything basically reverted to a, a much more primitive state. Um, they were very loaded. However, over time, what we see in these centuries is that they, they had began to settle down more. The Zippe was more important than the Comitatus. There was, in this sense, a greater um, communal development, like kings, like chieftains were increasing their their prestige and power. Uh, also, in a sacral sense, it was used to justify, because it was the only, again, uh, political language of that time, their own power. Right? You had to be military powerful, and so the more military power you had, the more divine power you had been given. That's why also they feared so much the Roman Empire, because they realized they had a massive power from their side, but they wanted to, to increase their own, and they would never back down, because the Germans ne never really thought them of themselves like being inferior to Rome, of course, and that, that's a great part of what the Romans also liked very much of these Germans, because they, they represented that kind of uh, conservative, aristocratic um, paradigm that you find in Tacitus, etc., um, that at a point want also to to portray the, the standard of, of the good savage, as if, um, you know, these peoples, for example, were more primitive than they actually were, but this absolutely doesn't mean what paranoid internationalists think that, you know, these peoples were actually advanced. No, they were brutally primitive, right? And uh, as a consequence, they were also savage and vicious, which is the same reason why they were so unstable. The Romans you know, as you know, wiped out from the face of the earth entire peoples, they destroyed the race, but their purpose was controlling them first, right? If it's just if they resisted, that was the move, but it was not dramatically frequent, especially among the, against the most civilized. Against the less civilized, it was a bit more problematic, because you couldn't really eradicate them, but essentially trying to, to wipe them out, as we've seen uh, they were doing in the, on the Pictish frontier, we were talking about it the other day, uh, the concept was simple. Kill everyone. Somebody will escape, but at least for, for a generation, you won't have enough enough warriors to put a problem. Next generation, maybe you'll have to think again. Um, the um, So the kings, in, in this sense, represented a bit like the the modern, the, even the Romanized version, as we will see, because Rome paid exactly them in order to expand their power, and that's, uh, as we've seen, and to control more, mm -hmm. to to prevent war bands to, to, to pillage, because this is also the, 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 the problem of, of the entire leadership, that in theory the kings were to be those same chieftains who waged wars, they were essentially the same thing, but there was a difference between the kind of semi-nomadic, uh, uh, seasonal raiding uh, by this uh, war bands of, of religious devotees that were to essentially exterminate the men, seize the women, and hopefully finding a new tri successful tribe. The zip begins to prevail like a, a slightly more centralized system, where again there, there are specific chieftains that are you know, cooperating with managing resources, distributing them in a more rational sense. So you have more sedentarism, you have more more farming, especially more cattle. Um, you have also an improvement of some way of the settlements, right? Uh, gradually, the, the various, there, there is no such thing like cities um, in Central Europe, but there is a, a gradual re, like the Celts were doing, this, this hill forts, that also trade, again, allows to sediment surplus over time. This is used to expand, to reinforce, to, to fortify, to stabilize. So the Germans had been going, uh, had been doing this. 
And as we were saying before, again, there were differences in the broader Germanic world. But it goes without saying that the the Roman frontier was the place where the greatest excha exchanges took place. I mean, especially the Rhineland waterway was a major uh, trade artery. Um, also, s Central Europe, um, the areas to today, Czech Republic, etc., had always been somewhat a bit more advanced since Celtic times and then eventually with the Marcomanni. Um, and, and that's the reason why there are Marcomannic Wars, for example, because the Marcomanni were more politically compact because they had achieved kind of a great degree of stability. Whereas, paradoxically, the, uh, the same Western Germans, the, the Ingevones, that had um, even crushed the, the Roman legions at the Battle of the Tudorburg Forest, uh, were, were underestimated because they, they, were, they were less of a threat. Right, the Romans were more concerned about the Barcomani. The entire way well, the, the, the virus was caught in the ambush, it was coming back from the pincer movement that would have had to, to invade uh, the Boyan with the best Roman legions and generals. And because nobody thought that the Western Germans were a threat, actually, Germany had been conquered pretty easily. And the, 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 the let's say the fear of the German had been essentially dispelled since the times of Marius and Caesar. They appeared relatively mild peoples, and this is, in fact, true, right? Even historically, say, the Thirty Years' War also spread the concept that the Germans were mild and tame, right? And today we think, still uh, stereotypically, that instead because of World War the Second, World the First, uh, or Prussian military culture, the, the Germans are somewhat fierce, whatever. There are some um, some different explanations to the stereotypes that are, in a sense, both correct, but this, in fact, depends on the degree of political effectiveness that a people has, right? Um, kings also in these uh, and they had two functions. One was mostly the military one, as we've seen, and so these were mostly short-lived, but relatively widespread powers, right? Being trusted military command, and so a broader political and strategic direction. But that normally ended with, with, the, with the end of war. But also, when, when does a, a war end in, in a Germanic reality? Uh, feuds were forever ongoing, right? So this is also what generally speaking, war does, right? It, it strengthens communities, right? Especially the ones that are more under pressure, the methods of stillis. I mean, the same Roman invasion of Germany had, had been a big deal. These peoples had m at large mostly seen really what the Roman army was capable of doing. They realized what, what kind of neighbors they had, like, before they knew each other, but um, until Ariovistus or, you know, from, from the the survivors of the Teutonic Magrave, nobody had really faced a Roman legion in battle. Or if somebody did, somewhere as a mercenary, as a you know, as a merchant that was passing by, well, it was had remained relatively in influent considering the mostly the the local the most important political local political horizons of the various tribes. The other role was the sacral one, as we've seen. This was longer lasting because in theory, in the traditional understanding of, of the world, of course, everybody had some sort of lineage to which that, that embodied, that, that, that mirrored the status of, of, of these people. Like um, there, there was a genetic component to that. Like if you have, you know, especially in more, back in tribal societies, like the warrior, also the physicality had a much greater, um, you know, importance in a way, because you really are much more directly involved into to hand-to-hand -hand combat. And uh, these were brutal areas that were covered in forests, swamps that were cold, um, scarcely fertile. So again, raiding was kind of normal. Um, and the, um, the, the cold, like the, the, the entire lifestyle had toughened up people more. 
right? If you wonder why Northern Europeans are taller, it's because you know they, they were naturally and also in this sense politically selected in a much more vicious way that had an impact even on those who had to survive, generally the largest. Uh, so th they were proud of this aspect. Also, the Romans were were eager to portray the, the stereotype of the of the Titan, the barbarian, the more ketonic monster was just big but kind of dumber. And whereas the, the Roman hero was is a is a sto stoic, spirited fighter. And the, the, the truth is actually that, and unironically, the, the the Germans, the Celts, told exactly the same thing. Uh, because in the memory of the Indo-Europeans, generally speaking, there was always this thing that the the, the pre-Indo-Europeans of Stratum had been subjugated was, uh, if not really genetically superior, but also very, say, richer, because the South was richer, right? There were more resources. So the idea of the giant, again, it it's present in the Norse mythology, in the Atlantic mythology, in the Roman, because it, it reflected that kind of barbarian. And the Germans fit well in, in that kind of idea. And they also saw themselves as the, the fairer, so the, the more, the pure, because all of these mythologies have to do with also the lighter complexion, etc. It was very interesting. Uh, in many ways, the same Roman senatorial gentes were based on that kind of genetic idea. And so, um, these are all, we, we, we often don't know the Germanic side of the story. Actually, we don't know it at all. So it would be interesting to know what they really thought about the Romans, etc., or in general, uh, the, the other peoples that they, and among, uh, and of each other, by the way. But it can't be understood, right, partly through the same Roman history and, and other hints. Uh, in any case, um, so the sacrality was stressed in a dynastic sense because if the principle is genetic it's also passed from uh, down to generations so this should facilitate the establishment of a longer run of just say one clan that rules you know it's those people and so there is this with greater surplus greater certification greater control and it will rise that way um, but as you have seen it was complicated to make other clients accept this. And albeit the formal existence of these type of rulers is very uh, scarce, nevertheless um, it existed and it was growing at this point. Um, the the sacral uh, king, let's call it in this way, by controlling certain rights, for example, certain having his interests revolving around a sanctuary, uh, festivals, pilgrimage. These things did exist. There were specific, you know, as you know, maybe certain mounds, certain lakes. Uh, there were plenty of this. Rice Tactus describes them. There are very interesting um, religious, um, let's say, uh, details about this. It reveals that kind of complexity also of the, of the same communities locally and in different cultural visions even of the world um, would ex exercise through such uh, authority for example in order to participate in ritual and overseeing the necessities of the community in that regard a, a greater power in fact greater control on, on the community the military leader, it could be the same, was the same, again, th there is no need to separate the two things, would protect to help defend the communities in times of war. It was expected a, a very high standards, right? The Germanic chieftains often fought dismounted in, in the head of the formation. That, there were, that kind of testing and selection was brutally uh, ensured by the fact that, you know, if you... Uh, if if you if you fight on horseback, for example, among the Germans, you're you're considered uh, like a coward. This was true also, like it had evolved as a concept. Of course, these leaders fought on horseback as well. The same Armenians is documented, etc. But the idea still of, of the majority is that 
you know, the hero fights on horseback can flee from the battlefield. At the Battle of Strasbourg, the Alemannic infantry forces the nobility to dismount to fight them in the phalanx because um, that was a security. They would fight to the death. They, they were lost anyway. But that tells how high the risk fact really was. Um, and in fact, it was the front lines were the strongest ones, and they had were made up in that kind of also retinue fashion to to show in a bit of this still heroic mindset. Um, the who was the better man the, to to rule, to live on, so to procreate, to to lead. That was seen just as a divine blessing. Um, and as we were saying before, mostly the, the distrust of the people brought only in times of war the possibility of a, of a single man being elected as the military leader of the entire community, entire tribe. Progress were starting to expand, however. Um, we um, uh, Also, it was a, a way an easy way to remove the responsible of defeat, as we were saying before, right? Also for saving face, ensuring the fact that it was under his medium that he had that the people had failed, because yes, it was their, still kind of their fault, but um, the other leader would do better. It also increased competition for better leadership, by the way. The Burgundians in the 4th century had probably a combination of these types of rulers, right? Evidence is questionable, but as a migrating people, the leadership, organizational, logistical, strategic needs were, were dramatically increased, right? That's why kingship also increases at this point. Because, because peoples were on the move. There had to be more power entrusted to the single leaders because they had to oversee more things, right? For the rest, the individual clans were pretty autonomous, self-sufficient. They were known as Fahrgemeinschaft, so some kind of uh, also logistically autonomous and uh, also politically, strategically autonomous reality of some sort. They knew how to leave um, off the land, but just literally making their own weapons, um, arranging their own thing, because there was no such thing like a state indeed the Burgundians as you know settle on the middle of Rhine and they are basically in between the Romans and the Huns and so they had already been significantly depleted by defeats against other people such as the Vandals etc and they they are eventually crushed by the Romans and deported to Sepaudia and the Nibelungen lead probably bears witness of this, right? In this story, it's Attila and the Huns, because also the Germans were deeply impressed with with the Huns. Um, but um, but probably it, it tells Ezio's story, and uh, even if it, everything takes place in, uh, at least the final battle takes place in Vienna, it's in Worms, that in fact the the Romans really crushed the Burgundians in in, in real history um, and in any case l political rule as you know can be obtained in very impalpable ways again we are mostly reasoning through a statistic and collectivistic mentality where we think in a structuralistic materialistic sense and also in a relativistic deterministic one that there is such thing like a state uh, it's an illusion the state does not exist Right, it's just people doing things. Right, we just rest on that idea, and we also use it to blame those who rule us. What we don't realize, instead, how it was very clear to to the ancient people that it's exclusively our fault for any kind of government we have and whatever they do. Right, um, totalitarianisms are wanted by the people. Yes, culturally underdeveloped people, nevertheless, still they they want that. They make it happen. All of that. And people are always exclusively and absolutely and totally responsible for every single damn thing any of the rulers actually do. Because they are the same thing. And the rulers are the direct expression of the people in everything. So, in other words, everybody deserves what they have. Um, 
local communities um, were cooperating at the time in this sense. Uh, everything was based on that kind of conviction that was evident to the various clan leaders, uh, the tribe, uh, chieftains, uh, etc., about what needed to be done. And there was often also a split. For example, in the aforementioned one between the Romans and the Huns, we, we find, like, at the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, you know, there are these respective categorical divisions. We often use didactically, right? From one side, there were the Visigoths, the other, the Ostrogoths. But actually, we know that there were bands of, diff of the same people from both sides. There were Franks, Alamanni split a bit between the two. Um, uh, and... Um, and more, because it was normal also for the the young men of the comitatus that were still part of the zip by a certain degree, because even there the, the distinction is not so radical, they would inform others. Right? Imagine you are, as, you, as there was plenty of, uh, Germanic warriors that fight in the Roman army for a lifetime and go back wherever they came at, at discharge, it happened, right? Uh, in, uh, we find them in graves, in places like Jutland, etc. You, these people were proud Roman veterans, but of course they were, whatever their tribe was, they were, they were proud equally of that too, right? This was the point of Romanity. You could be a Roman, but maintaining your own tribal identity, whatever. And having fought for the best military in the world was the greatest honor for any warrior. That's why also these peoples knew, began how to organize themselves better. We have seen it even in the Gaelic sagas that they were probably Roman trained uh, Celtic units. Do we know that? Because there were, was plenty of them. We find them in the Notitia Dignitatum, in the various, um, uh, you know, various units with the shield panels, very also beautiful to see totemically speaking, were trained by the Romans. And this helped. Uh, in the face of a of a lower collective discipline, normally of tribal peoples, the uh, the increase also of their military standards, like the Germanic confederacies, begin to 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 fight better. Like the the Alemannic infantry charges are after the Sasanian. Cataphracts, basically the greatest threat the, the Roman army meets and copes with successfully, by the way. But, I mean, these peoples were really something. Also, cavalry develops, especially among the Eastern Germans. There are more uh, mixed with the steppes peoples. And they really develop a hell of a Western culture. But it's the development of the elite that spreads that Western culture. All Indo-European peoples were literally fixated, obsessed um, uh, hyper overly hyped with the concept of being a horseman like the entire Indo-European mythology revolves exclusively about that uh, around that um, even these peoples like the, especially the early Germans that were literally among the, 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 the peoples in Europe that made the least use of cavalry in, 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 in absolute and relative terms uh, were obsessed with horses Tacitus talks about that too um they were used to, to make divination, things like that. Um, they, they were involved in rituals of war, this kind of also inducing this shamanic trance in this, uh, to, to initiate um, a, in some kind of, kind of a higher status for, for the, the, the military devotees of the comitatus. Everybody was obsessed with that. Um, the Romans had far better cavalry in that kind of, you know, equestrian cult obsession and uh, a great deal of Germanic armor of course comes from from the Roman side right the same Francisca for example okay it's not connected to to horsemanship but um, say well it's a Frankish thing game name to, it was probably a Roman thing like later on the Danish acts were probably a, a Carolingian thing um, the it th was plenty like a, a, a large mass of Germanic youth that was normally trained in the Roman army, in the Roman Empire, and gave, uh, went back to Germany. So this had a crucial impact, right? It's a bit like, uh, except the, the straight, but in the Viking era, right? You know, the, the, the military quality of the, of the 
Vikings increases over time because they get Frankicized by a certain degree, right? Uh, they are ever more cohesive, effective, heavier. Cavalry is developed because, of course, that hybrid warfare brought to it unavoidably uh, elites became more powerful. Right? This is what happened in the Viking era too. The Scandinavians were were freaking out that now these uh, the, the Comitatus factory was was l plundering. Um, and looting so much overseas and coming back to Scandinavia and uninjuring all the political social balance, bega beginning to rule on other people. That's how the Scandinavian feudal monarchies began to happen. But this brought to, to a real break with tradition. It was impactful and brutal. And th probably the same thing had happened in, in, in Germany as well by in, in Roman times, but more gradually, but, but still. Um, so this military aspect is really crucial and somewhat overlooked, but archaeologically is also very well witnessed. Um, the, it was normal, by the way, to equip themselves with, uh, with foreign uh, equipment, especially the, the best uh, arm panoplies, with especially the best one. I mean, the early Germans normally took from the Celts, right? The result doesn't really make too much sense to try to distinguish the the, the kind of equipment because um, as we were saying before say in the uh, in, in the in the Augustan era that you have something very primitive like stone spear heads things like this but let's say the elite like the the Germanic chieftain would have had an excellent kind of Celto-Roman panoply to boast his power and prestige and the fact that he had been able to massacre somebody to get them or maybe purchasing them <laughs> but uh, there was both things at the same time because we were who knows where the hell those 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 uh, weapons and armor came from and uh, so uh, it was grandiose probably to to the the German eyes with, with the Roman army had really displayed like and this th this is kind of obvious because we know and this is witnessed also in the in the Gallic Wars certain, certain people had never seen anything like that especially their engineering capacities the collective training uh, the standardized discipline equipment right it was, was something astonishing the order of the of the Roman host right you have an idea what was the the degree of in, of collective training of a Roman legion, right? In relative terms, it's possible that no other army in history had anything so uh, morally empowering like that, right? The Roman legionaries were trained were trained to think they were the best thing that ever happened in the history of mankind, and by by a certain degree, they they were absolutely right, right? So it's all the more impacting to see, on the other hand, such such, such uh, primitive peoples responding by saying yes we are again Germany was taken over but also took itself over back uh, and uh, they pose a problem because the broader aptness to, to war this habitual also the, the cheaper cost of life and simply saying you know what I, no, it's just a life of shit I, to make it shit here as a Roman slave I would prefer to die Rather, and so it happened, but in the following centuries it was mostly like a balance because they understood that there was not really much they could do against one another. Right. Um, a great deal of the confederacies worked through some sort of shared power, however, where a sort of arbitration. Uh, essentially, the various chieftains would have to confer their own power, that is, providing their own military and commanding it themselves under this guy's uh, overlordship. So there were some sort of primitive council. We know the Gauls had even kind of magistrates, etc. It, everything revolved around war, as always. But the problem was organizing it, paying for it. Right, so adjudicating, also uh, resolving disputes, 
and the part is accepting the judgment. There couldn't be, for example, an internal divide. The, um, the, the, the all the Germanic law, also from later times, stresses that every time there was a feud, the most important thing was to immediately compensate each other because they couldn't afford a political division because in, in those conditions they would have been eaten alive by whoever would have found them divided. And naturally this shows how divided they really were because otherwise it would have not been much of a problem. Um, so there was an enormous effort in the face of, of an, an, an annihilation threat to try to make thing, things work on a larger scale than they were, they were habituated collectively, right, cooperating. The 4th century leaders of the Gothic Confederation of the Lower Danube, for example, are referred to by the Romans as judges, exactly because they had to arbitrate among, the, among themselves, right, to, to organize themselves better, considered that these peoples were settled at that time uh, in the former Roman Dacia. They occupied the Trajan's wall, which w w was a very complex net of fortifications uh, both in the Carpathian Basin and in the Black Sea one it was a very complex thing what where, that's where they had entrenched um, in Transylvania in, in areas that were really impenetrable and very difficult to tame like the Romans had been there and against the Dacians had managed to finally crush them because it was because Dacia was m much of a more evolved state at the time much more compact one and than even these um, confederacies. Um, and so there was a lot to manage locally as well, infrastructures, other peoples, people's subjects, m more populated areas, okay, not maybe so much, but compared to most of, you know, Northern Europe too, they had to manage the, the migration fluxes, also of other peoples, especially the Goths. But it was normal, like for war bands to cross somebody else's. Um, see, they, they didn't even have a real concept of land, telling the truth, because as semi nomadic, at least, or uh, very much concentrated on their own clinic cohesion, it was not much of what kind of land they occupied. They didn't, wouldn't see it as theirs in the sense, Bluetooth Bowden, right? They still had a celestial mentality, whereas. Uh, the, the, the more agricultural sedentary populations were more tied to that place and they wouldn't move, right? These were, it, it, all what mattered was their blood in many ways and not the land as such. Uh, it's uh, also unironically true considering the, the astro-nationalistic slogan of Bluetooth and Bowden that doesn't understand anything about historical realities, but still, of course, they cared about the land they had earned. Right, and at this time again, they were evolving through because these were also Romanized areas. You know, the, the subjects had known uh, more advanced administration, whatever. So things were changing. Um, so elsewhere, as in the Frankish and Almanic Confederacy, we see many petty kings, as we were saying before, that are only occasionally ruled when the Romans lost their grip by an over king. And again. The gods were richer, more prosper, more powerful. They were more surplus. They had more powerful elites. Um, the West Germans weren't like that. They were much more fragmented. They couldn't quite um, uh, stick together, if anything, f if not for, for, for these temporary moments. And naturally, everything revolved around wealth in many ways, also motivation. Right, but they reciprocally influence each other. Um, so the primary reason was, of course, threat of annihilation, so sort of losing power. Right, so this motivated enough, and this power was based on wealth provided largely by the Romans. Roman artifacts were much prized in the barbaricum, as we know. Um, even the Celtic kings on the even of, uh, eve of Roman conquest were pretty much, uh, you know, provided, gifted in, in that sense. Um, and this is how it normally happens, right? You 
again, war is never an isolated act and you kind of know your neighbor and so uh, you know also how to take him over to a certain degree. Um, other wealth, the majority of wealth, however, still derived from local resources that, however, were mainly in the hands of the various separate clans. So they had to put something in common, just like the army that had to be supplied. So that was the point. If you don't have the level of centralization, you cannot accomplish anything. Right? All great civilizations are powerful because they, not because they're uh, socialistic, but on the contrary, because they they have the moral power to put things in common for the specific function not to be parasitically maintained for no reason but because they have that specific reason so only states come to rule right and that's why in the history of mankind states ruled over tribes and tribes couldn't rule anyone until they were states themselves and in fact i find it uh, disgusting how modern conservatism this should be an intelligent thing but of course on average if you are if you live in a in a diseased reality, it doesn't matter whether you're a liberal or conservative, you suck anyway. And the, ver the sucking version of, of, of conservatism is destroying the state. Um, just like communists uh, are iconoclasts, and at the end of the day, what they really want is not really controlling everyone, because it doesn't work, but literally destroying the state. Right? It's like with communism as well. Desperation brings to somebody taking over dictatorially, but the system eventually collapses because it's just a stupid socio-economical recipe. Um, and that's how they destroy it all, because it doesn't stand on its feet. Well, conservatives are starting to do the same. They're giving up, like, cowards, anything, public education, um, and, and the properly, even military intervention, even the capacity of being a power in the world, exactly because they're weak, right? These peoples were doing the exact opposite were developing like crazy for the time standards because they knew exactly what they wanted to do. If you don't know what you have to do, you cannot go anywhere. You will simply collapse on yourself, right? And that's, it, it's always this. Moral force brings to political cohesion and therefore military victory. It's knowledge about what you have to do and what works and uh, that's why civilizations take over other peoples. And these peoples eventually actually benefit from it in perspective, in spite of the previous uh, distress, um, because the civilizations are really superior. And this is what is not being taught anywhere anymore. And of course, everything collapses, because that's the ultimate goal of self hating people, both from the left and the right. Uh, leaders could have some control on wealth um, through a system of gift exchange uh, that it could maintain loyalty through among the scattered communities. Uh, and especially if they could circulate these goods amongst rival local families and playing them off against each other. The Romans could pay out large sums to their friends across the frontier equally for the same reason they wanted to support one side rather than another and keeping the balance these gifts could play a big part in the creation of barbarian political power um, this means that also a lot of wealth that was produced in the empire would flow to the so called uh, free Germany uh, as a sort again of uh, of boosting for the local powers uh, but also north uh, further north even in in Britain North Britain so as stated earlier the Romans may have indeed played a major part in the creation of the new confederacies exactly in this way paying large tributes to barbarian leaders to keep them quiet in periods of civil war, Roman civil war, as it was frequent, exactly in the moment in which these confederacies become powerful, the third or fourth century. Again, it's because they spot the Roman weakness, but at the same time, the Romans buy them off temporarily like that. Um, and this helps barbarian paramount kings to appear 
when the Romans were distracted as well. They had something more to compete for, right? Aside from the agricultural resources and the gifts that were also connected, one could maintain power via trade, right? Trade, uh, as we've seen, played a major role in international relations. Um, and in late Roman period, we see creation of trading stations beyond the frontier. Uh, the most famous sites are Lundeborg in Thin, Denmark, which was paired also with a high status settlement just inland at Gudme. Another s such site is known on the other side of the Jutland Peninsula at Dunkirke. Right? And these areas are, as you understand, far away from Roman domination, or at least, you know, are actually pretty close, um, and they interfere with it uh, constantly. As we've seen, there were troops from there. It was all that interconnected, but still it shows that locally, these are strictly local uh, rulers. There is the capacity of establishing some sort of control on the major trading post, uh, garrisoning them, uh, essentially integrating them in a broader net of possessions of hill forts, of um, also pathways, by the way, because we the, there wasn't anything in this world like the Roman network system, but were important. Um, say highways in areas, especially across moors, or difficult areas that have been built over time or periodically maintained. Nothing present. There were, there were hidden pathways um, for crossing, even again, uh, swamps, forests, etc. There was a great deal of, uh, let's say, of, sort of strategic value to them because the local tribes knew very well all these hidden paths and they knew how to surprise the enemy in ambushes in you know attracting them in, in difficult terrain creating blockades I mean the Battle of Sudeberg Forest is quite example of it there also on a bigger scale consider the level of organization the enormous effort of bringing even all those tribes together giving them something to fight for right whereas they, they had never had it up to that point because they they didn't even have a much of a of a collective identity right and that's why also the relation with Rome contributed to, to boost this right so um, we really find local elites capable of controlling these important resources and storing them in their fortresses and using them to to enlarge their retinues pretty modest stuff Right. This is still a very primitive reality, um, but it's still more than whatever it had existed there before, right? And it definitely increases. And the power levied by the confederacies in the process was really remarkable, as we know. We see armies of, you know essentially standard field armies of 30,000 men as it was basically the, the top average and the actual average say in those times and also in later ones it could in this sense meet in open field uh, with, with the Roman army and even hoping to be successful in the enterprise the Romans were much better organized disciplined armed um, in a in a broader sense but um, as the state declines you know in, in in the empire of course the the odds tend to level right uh, of course the Romans were uh, more advanced but what when we look at, at these times more advanced is for, for those time standards in, pr in practice in absolute terms uh, there isn't this huge divide let's say between a, a Roman or a or a Germanic army at, at this point, right? They start looking much more similar also because, as we've seen, um, they're also sometimes the same people. 
they have the, the, the same training the same they, they know each other too right so this has th this background so at an individual level has been largely lost also because Roman historiography is ever more elite so it had never talked about even NCOs or our stories like that if not from the top think about Caesar about the centurions but say think about all these various contractors uh, trainers um, in fact uh, even uh, think about the the military economy of this all who produced weapons and sold them like how they were tested uh, it was a an entire region or entire regions revolving around this kind of uh, continuous warfare and relation and an alliance and and hostility uh, and th this is it's not surprising that the Germanic epos seems to have such a deep root in in the migration era time because you have to think that even these peoples the, their chieftains and leaders they were galvanized by acquiring such great having acquired such great power from times that literally uh, in their memory whatever it was like w was like just very new these people were coming out of of an age of uh, of myth right and in and still living within it and appreciating the large scale capacities that they finally achieved uh, we think interestingly enough of the Roman frontier in a defensive sense but think about the the, the barbarians they had from the other side equally a, a defensive frontier uh, in fact, they would start to have enough m manpower control to construct large-scale defensive sites um, or to integrate the Roman ones that had taken over and they had functionalized just changing the site of the of the of the employee also because again they were not they were hardly ever uh, single uh, lines of defense were mostly forts uh, connected with one another large scale that could be used um, in different ways some would be destroyed other built again this as we were saying before for the Terbingi in the, in the Trajan wall well were very complex defensive systems of valley of uh, so you have this 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 walls palisades forts towers ditches um, all say uh, hinged to natural obstacles of various sort and um, all of this stimulates dramatically also the political and strategic capacity of of the politics that control them because they require um, evidently a uh, um, a coordinated effort and you and for that you you need to put in common those resources to best so um, what is also more interesting perhaps is that in the process of um, pr production of symbols and items of authority from the barbarian side you see that the skilled craftsmen these people uh, were commissioned uh, items often based on Roman badges of office we know that that uh, Germanic leaders were very often especially if they were federated by that matter they, they were buried with specific Roman symbols also Hunnic ones very often mixed Clovis father's grave was found and it, it displayed both right but he was in fact a Roman general at the end of the day he, he fought had been fighting for the empires his whole life and he he wanted in death in front of the gods or God actually because they really believed all in one God even in paganism to to appear as an imperial 
officer, right? So a, um, a warrior who shared that ecumenic power with that the, the greatest, in fact, military in, in the world, uh, the same Hannik symbols, especially the ones brought by the steppes, were over lordship was something really big, much greater than what existed in Germany. These this elites were very eager to adopt them, right? Uh, we know this, that uh, from the Germanic kingship, na uh, onomastics under the Huns, there were some suffixes like Ock added to uh, Germanic root name that are essentially the same one of Yuks, like the Kalmuks, the Seljuks, etc., that were um, were in fact used to to be more presentable among the the steppes elites, right? The Hanek kind of Turkic, uh, Mongol ones, etc. And this would stick. We know they adopted a lot of uh, equestrian practices, zootechnic capacities. It was a different world that had to be managed. Larger amount of herds for more effective cavalry. This is especially among the East Germans. It is, it is not as historically, right? So much that, in fact, even the Franks would tribe it to the Visigoths, to the Longobards, a much greater equestrian culture still in Carolingian times by 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 honor, by historical memory that once they had been that skillful, even though at that point the Carolingian cavalry was really already more developed than one. But in Frankish times, where there was a very few cavalry, so it was, it was important among them specifically. I mean, there was, right, maybe not even so few, but um, having cavalry required more power, and this power had to be exercised on more people. And you had to tame those people. And this is incidentally what also Clovis put to in that regard. And that's part of the reason why Frankish cavalry, even before the Carolingians, were so powerful. Also, well, okay, because of the Gallo-Roman estates that had remained largely intact, but altogether, right? So, think about this increased power and the fact that they were, the, the barbarians were essentially trying to imitate the larger powers they knew, right? Uh, the, the Roman influence here is overwhelming. And, and the vocabulary of power was really the same. Along the Upper Rhine frontier, in the Alemannic region, we see a number of Hohenzidlungen, so high settlements, hill forts, which reveal high quality craft, specialization, manufacture, and iron carbon balance that basically would be steel depending on which kind of of indicators you use for modern engineering <laughs> you know none of the even of the medieval iron is still practically but still it was the, the famous calbis noricum was what the, the romans also made their their glide with and well during the migration era production shifts towards the middle of rhine interestingly enough and you realize there is a deep organization. It would remain there for most of the, in fact, the early middle, middle, middle ages. As the may, as you know, the, the the Vikings would buy weapons from there too. They were exported as far as you know, Volga, Bulgaria. We, we talked about it in the dedicated video a couple of weeks ago. Um, so there is a great organization, a much greater centralization than before. Again, quite modest if we look at it in the bigger scale of things, but enormous in relative terms for the times and places, right? And and the high settlements speak by, uh, by themselves. There was enough power to concentrate in these hill forts, um, uh, just even for reinforcing them gradually, right? Adding new structures. So, coming to ro lord from there. Again, modest centers. They could be easily stormed in a way because, um, you know, it's the same reason why you know, cities decline at this point and the sophisticated torsion and uh, engine catapults also disappear because, you know, what do you need to use them for? To, to, to storm a moat, right? Uh, you can't just take it 
by hunger, um, you know, assaulting it more, more easily uh, with fire and other things. Um, but still, the fact that this level of surplus storing concentration had not existed before is not witnessed historically, archaeologically, and before this time is, is quite meaningful about these specific times. Because those various, say, polities that would also gradually coalesce as more defined over times and remaining made lots of videos about, for example, the the ancient Turingi and medieval Turingia, right? Very, you know, uh, floating areas territorially, because again, centralization was scarce, but still, areas of Europe that went on with kind of their own separated identity, um, ever more consolidated, gradually, on on the base of this essentially feudal system that was. Um, evolving quite gradually. Recently we have seen the Pictish Brocks. Uh, when we look at North Britain in sites like Tapra and Lao, uh, we realize that it was a, a big deal for purification that the, 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 the Pictish Brocks were just kind of round, very primitive, often even unhygienic uh, round towers, right, in stone. Right, and these were expanded over time. Nothing in, in terms of complexity like the, the Roman castra along the frontiers, etc. They were also, in fact, reused by these peoples in the same ways. Much of the, definitely in post Roman Europe, the, the main fortifications in early medieval times followed essentially the Roman centers, right? Uh, that were much more massively and, you know, extensively built um, if anything in stone I mean something that uh, would be a mirage in, in Central Europe at large up to the 12th century fundamentally so but um, still connecting them in original ways that corresponded to new polities to new peoples new allegiances right and even in low-lying areas we can find similar prestige sites such as at Gennep in the Frankish uh, today's Netherlands uh, just south of, of the Rhine uh, those areas will be very important I made a video about the the Friese by the way uh, that uh, is being watched and that speaks even there of specific Roman fortification F in fact you realize that it was in the southwest of the fortresses late because that was the Roman frontier in the east where was everything was much more savage and wilder in a way and less populated more um, we in the Frankish lands as we were saying before and along the Rhine the, there has come to light a fairly large scale organized iron working there was a appearing evenly showing an important amount of surplus, not just available for organizing such work, but also for exporting weapons. Um, and those were areas where the Roman legions had been stationed for centuries. There were probably some infrastructures that facilitated this, right? Uh, Norcom declined also for, for other reasons. It went depopulated more, more easily. There was hardly ever or like a stable people that would stay there mostly and the center was mostly in the Pannonian plain and there were mostly steppe peoples whereas the Germans circled around and were uh, the center of power was different in nature at that point in another area um, and around the hedges of the empire larger and potentially powerful kingdoms were thus formed uh, some depended heavily upon relationships with Rome, as we've seen, but it may be that by uh, the end of the 4th century, some rulers just beyond the frontier could maintain quite independent and efficient systems of government by themselves. Um, as we were saying before, 
um, international relations, contacts, etc., were much more far-ranging than we think. Uh, so uh, the imperial policy was always present. Like even in the sixth century, you find um, you know a, a very big uh, international game. You know with the Aryan pagan axes of you know the the Goths and say Central Europe versus the Roman Catholic one of the Franks and of the of Constantinople. So realize that everyone was involved. But that's exactly what I mean. I mean, the Thuringi, the aforementioned ones in Central Europe, well, those were something that could really take sides in that way and marry into, I don't know, Frankish royalty. Clovis was half Thuringian, for example. And just think the difference, the divide. The Franks would eventually colonize Thuringia after having crushed it together with the, with the help of the Saxons. And it would take a long time there to develop further where also, the Romans had given up centuries before, but in different, in a different situation. The world ages and grows. Um, so definitely, the sixth century um, Magna Germania or Germania was uh, definitely something else compared to Augustus' times, and half of a millennium had passed. Right? Again. If we take the same post-Roman standards, those were pretty underdeveloped areas, but pretty underdeveloped. But the relative growth is enormous, and also in the in the medieval millennium, as you know, uh, Germany would pass from this state to being the most technologically advanced country in Europe, together with Italy. Right. So, if you think about it in relative terms. It is the start of something very impressive. Uh, it may be that the Germans further um, into the Magna Germania were more dependent upon Roman gifts paid to help them keep the frontier kings in check as well. Right. Um, the role of Roman authority in the local Germanic communities can also be seen in the frequency with which the aforementioned badges of office like belt sets were used in grave depots in large cremation cemeteries for example of the Saxon homelands that you would think being kind of more distant no as we've seen uh, the Jutland etc were fully connected with Rome and quite kind of Romanized in, in these um, in the symbols of power and kind of elite development. Again, it couldn't be otherwise. Uh, Brooch styles to confirm this. In some, barbarian politics were played for high stakes, right? And these stakes were often raised by the Romans themselves. Uh, and again, it it's kind of normal. Uh, in the In the broader international logic for the aforementioned reasons. There were strong barbarian rulers on the frontier who could increase their authority over their neighbors that Rome could play on. And conversely, albeit they could be a threat in moment of Roman destabilization, there was also a considerable extent by which these barbarian rulers depended upon the continued effective functioning of the Roman Empire. Which is also maybe part of the reason why they the system was unhinged when Rome began to economize, per, for example, more, um, just as it was doing from within the same empire, like regarding, because just because they were shorter of demographic and ag agricultural resources. And this would explain what happened uh, also when the empire ceased to function effectively. Because uh, the, the situation could be pretty much desperated from lots of other intervening factors from the outside, from, from the inside. And that connection that had been formed by the Romans, between the Romans and the Germans, could not really be uh the salt anymore in historical perspective 
All right. Um, so this was an interesting topic, um, and I'm glad to have made this video. Uh, we will keep talking about such things again because, you know, they're really important issues. Again, there is always the Migration Era playlist if you are interested in the updates. Uh, for today, however, I stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.